Can people hear me? Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming. This is awesome. So uh, this is the first workshop on large scale video recommendation systems. And our, what we're trying to do here is we want to bring together renowned researchers and industry experts uh, in the field to right, talk about the latest advancements, uh, techniques and approaches that are shaping the future of uh, large scale video systems. Uh, there's Four of us who organized this, uh, myself, Andrad, uh, Kushal, and uh, Ame, and Sara also helped, also was an organizer, but wasn't able to be here today, but I think is here virtually. Uh, perhaps, Sara, are you here? Yes, he's coming. Ah, he's here, he's here, yeah, great, great. The wonders of virtual stuff. So, why this workshop? So, video consumption is a very common application. In fact, 4.8 billion people watch video over the internet every year. It's a, it's, a, it's a large importance to society. Now, there are some challenges in the video recommendation system that are somewhat unique to the domain. Uh, one of the largest is content understanding involves many time invariant modalities. For example, audio, visual, object detection, motion, story, uh, narrative. There's all this, this understanding of the content that is not the same in like every recommendation domain. Uh, another key challenge to the video recommendation problem is that users often desire novelty. For example, it's pretty rare for someone to watch the same piece of content 10 plus times. Whereas, for example, someone could order the same food staple, for example, carrots, repeatedly. Um, and another big part, uh, characteristic of this domain is that content is often new, sometimes at a large scale. Uh, this is partly due to the fact that the users desire, or consumers of internet of video often desire new content, so people are often making new content. But Particularly with the percolation of cell phones and cameras on that, it's very cheap to create video content now. And so there's, there's a lot of it. And so content cold start problems are often important at scale. So what are we trying to achieve in this workshop? So three things mostly. One is we'd like to exchange knowledge. Rex, this is a great uh, uh, event altogether. This is one of the highlights of it. And the second is we want to highlight interesting problems and solutions in the video recommendation space. And we want to foster discussions. I mean, I'm just very glad to see I have so many people in the room, and you know, we have many more on the on the call. And so, you know, a lot of this is is like this is for you, the community, right? And so this is, hopefully we can encourage discussions and do even better here. So I want to talk through some. We have a pretty excited about our, our speakers and invited to talk. So our, uh, Lucas Health is our, going to give our keynote in a couple of minutes and on YouTube Discovery Evolution. And, uh, Lucas is a principal engineer at YouTube Discovery, working on uh, improving YouTube's recommendations for over eight years. Uh, he graduated from Warsaw and uh, yeah, it's been at Google a total of 12, so I'm uh, excited for all our talks. We end up get to hear that one shortly. Um, Thomas um, is uh, big, we hear from, uh, from Instagram, and uh, he's been basically leading a now on Instagram on focusing on a lot of areas, including recommendations, ranking, and content understanding. Um, he was, previously he was at Google doing ads optimization, and he, he studied in France and holds three master's degrees in mathematics, statistics, and financial engineering. So, so I think that counts as an overachiever. Min <laughs> <laughs> uh, Min Chen uh, will be speaking at 405 after the coffee break on uh, intense and journeys and LLM approach. Uh, she's a senior research scientist at Google Brain leads both fundamental and applied research and you know, over 100 launches in uh, different products. Uh, and 
is interested in lots of things, but some of it is like RL and ML techniques for long, long term value. Um, and uh, Mark <coughs> is uh, uh, here from Netflix, and he's going to talk on from Stranger Things to Your Things Netflix recommendation evolution. And uh, Mark's a senior research scientist at Netflix who's uh, been doing machine learning for personalized video ranking. Uh, previously, he was at what's Whisper text, and uh, he's attained a PhD and dual MS degrees uh, from the University of Michigan. And, uh, I'm from Wisconsin, so no one's perfect, but I'm still glad you're here. And uh, Quinn Pinka is will be uh, speaking at 505 on reinforcement learning for short video recommender systems. And uh, he's a staff engineer at uh, Kausha. Uh, where he leads the reinforcement learning uh, for recommendations group. Uh, he's a member of the CCF multi-agent group. Uh, previously, he was at Alibaba, and he received his PhD from the Institute of Endocrine Personality Information Sciences, uh, which is headed by Andrew Thiel. So the format for the invited talks, they'll be 25 minutes long, uh, with a five-minute uh, question period. Both facilitated by our wonderful student volunteers. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll take questions both in the Zoom call or in person. And uh, yeah, so hopefully, and we'll do this, we'll have a coffee break from about 3 20 to 4 o'clock. So, and with that, I will, uh, I will, so. You just had it into it, but I get to introduce him again. So uh, Lucas will, uh, uh, he's been at Google for 11 years, eight of them focusing on recommendation systems uh, as an expert on the entire stack. Uh, and is I'm very excited for this talk because he's going to talk through YouTube discovery evolution. Uh, as I said before, he attended uh, University of Warsaw and uh, he likes to climb. So if there's any climbers afterwards, you can uh, hit them up for that as well. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I'm honored to stand here. I really appreciate the work that the research community does for the recommender systems. This is shaping the future, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so I've been working on this stuff for eight years. I had some general observations that I wanted to share today and just it's not anything specific, but just enough to share my general observations in this area. Um, so first I want to talk about scale. I think it's it's something that the LLM community really talks about a lot. The bigger the better, you know, they compare sizes and so like trying to understand how this impacts the the quality of the output, um, and I think it's good to talk about it in the in, in the context of recommendations as well. Um, so I basically want to give you this timeline. I joined uh, YouTube Discovery in 2015. We at the time we had a linear model. It was uh, maybe not like a typical linear model. How you think about small models? It was like a probably like had billions of dimensions, but it was extremely sparse. So for every request, we would retrieve just a handful of, of these weights, combine them into a prediction, and then serve it to our users. It was very efficient, pretty much at a runtime. We would just basically do a hash map lookup for maybe 100 features or something like that, and then get the output of the model. It was very hard to work with because every single Feature had to be manually engineered, feature process had to be manually engineered. So a lot of work just went into feature engineering work. Uh, they weren't very robust either, so had a lot of outliers and, and sort of um, didn't work. I mean, at the time it was state of the art, but I guess nowadays we would think that it was uh, you know, like playing with toys. Um, in 2016, that was the first year we introduced the deep learning model, uh, the deep model. Uh, I think we've copied the success of the ImageNet. Uh, people realized that deep model is, is the thing. Uh, and it did actually make a big difference. Uh, we stopped doing feature engineering that much, started focusing on the architecture of the model. 
Um, and over the years, these models just got bigger. So 2019, we published a paper about multitask ranking. Uh, if you're interested, please read about it. Uh, so the model got bigger. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, the model is even bigger. Uh, it doesn't really matter how many parameters it has. It's just you can think of it as, as pretty much much, much larger than what we used to have. Uh, so it got so big that we started having problems with training stability. Another paper that was published this year is, is about how to actually make these models a little bit more stable when we train them. Uh, the interesting challenge that we face in, in YouTube is that our corpus keeps changing very rapidly. So every day the distribution of our data is kind of different from yesterday. And, and that difference is really large. And, and these systems have to train continuously. So that's why that instability came in. But I think so, I, I just show you this picture, you know, models get bigger, but how do we kind of quantify it? How do we touch it? Say, you know, this is better, the 2023 model is better than the 2019 model. Um, so I like to think of it as different animals. You know, when, when I go to the, when I think about animals, I think, you know, maybe a gecko, he has around 1 million neurons in their brain. There's a mouse, 10 million neurons in their brain, and an owl, 100 million. And you can kind of tell that they have different skills, right? Like a mouse is going to be a little bit, like it has more skills than a gecko, right? And an owl probably even more skills than, than a mouse, uh, which, is, which feels obvious to us when we look at it. But then I think we have some kind of a marketing problem with recommendations, because when I think about these brains now, okay, so this one gives me a PCTR of 0 0.321, another one 0 0.29 and 302, which is pretty much meaningless, right? We can't really tell how much better is the, the big model versus the medium model versus the small model. Of course, we look at AUC, AUC metrics or maybe some offline loss metrics, but it's really hard to touch it, kind of like people do with LLMs where they, you know, they look at the output, it's just impressive, right? or, or some generative models, like you can look at the image, it's very impressive. So I, I think there is a problem in general recommendation community that we don't have these aha moments uh, that we can share with people. Uh, but let's, you know, let's at least give it a try. So I, I look back in 2015, trying to find some watch next panels uh, with, with some errors that the system used to make. And just to compare it to today, 2023, uh, first of all, you can see that the UI hasn't changed that much. I mean, maybe we should complain to our UI designers. Uh, <laughs> but the, but the interesting thing is that in, in this 2015 panel, you can see that there's some, so the, the, we have the watch video, the, the GT350 car. Um, in 2015, you can see that some videos are about the cars as well. And there's these two outlier videos. It just, it was reported as a bug at the time that it was unrelated to the watch video, unrelated to the user, just complete nonsense. Um, so I compared it with, with today's panel, 2023, there's no outliers. Uh, and I think it's it's a general trend. We do see less reports. We do see people complain less about these outliers. So something has improved. Okay, we can kind of touch it. So the scale helped, right? Like 2015, there was these weird video recommendations. 2023, much better. Of course, there are still outliers. People still complain, rightfully so. They should. Um, but it did get better in that sense. Um, so a more like the first benefit that I can think of is the simplicity of the system. When the, when the brain or the, the ranking model is small, we have to patch it with some level of different heuristics. So you can see here, we have some rules on top of it. Maybe it suggests off-putting candidates, something that users don't really like, or maybe unrelated candidates, maybe you know, some different weird errors that we have to patch with some heuristics. The problem with heuristics is that they are non-learnable parameters. So once we put it into a system, we either have to reevaluate them regularly every year, every half, half a year, or they just stay there and, and actually cause more harm than, than benefit after some time. But now if we have a bigger brain, it turns out that we can get rid of these heuristics and, and it actually is happening. Like we have been able to unlaunch many of these rules, manual rules that were patching the, the errors of the system and then just let the big brain kind of decide what to show to users, which I think is a great, great outcome. Um, another benefit of scaling is reliable offline data. So it turns out that we always struggled with being able to correlate ML loss with online performance. So most of our tests are A-B tests. We have to just 
run these A-B tests. It takes order of weeks to get the results. You probably all know about A-B tests and how slow and annoying sometimes they can be. But it turns out that if you have a big enough model, the correlation starts to appear. You can just look at ML loss and say, this model is better than the other one. Um, and then you can get this evaluation in, in the number of days instead of number of, of, month, of weeks. So this is a big improvement for us as well. Um, so I think scale helps in these cases. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about is objective maximization. We, we talk about it all the time. Um, we want to pick the right objective. For YouTube, we, we care about user satisfaction. We want to make sure that um, lifetime satisfaction is the, as high as possible. Obviously, that's very, very hard to measure. So we use proxies. These proxies evolve over time as we learn more about our users. Um, we did find that satisfaction is very important. Like it's, it's something that um, if we can have a dialogue with the user and they can tell us when they're satisfied, it actually does improve uh, uh, their interaction with YouTube over time in a positive way. Um, but I also wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this objective maximization. So yes, we set up a system that tries to maximize some objective. What are the consequences of that? Well, one observation that I have is uh, every ranked system with a feedback loop is a form of an RL system. Um, so the objective, so let's assume that we have some ML estimator that is trying to estimate some type of objective. It could be clicks, it could be something else, doesn't really matter. As long as we rank the list by this estimator and have this feedback loop, it will continuously improve itself, even if we didn't really intend it to do so. Uh, let me just explain a little bit more how that works. Um, so let's assume we have two classes of videos, the blue curve and the, the orange curve. Um, so let's assume that the blue is representing head, maybe the orange is representing tail, or it could be fresh versus old, or familiar versus unfamiliar, just different type of predictions. And so we have a model that is trying to opt the make a prediction in that space, in these objectives. And let's assume that this orange curve has a, you know, like a wider gaussian. The model makes more mistakes than, than in the blue curve. Uh, so generally we would say that the model is, you know, it, it kind of is stochastic, so it would sample its results in that curve, both of these curves. But since we are ordering by the predicted score, we would tend to pick items on the right side. Right? So we kind of tend to pick the over predictions rather than the under predictions. If something's under predicted, it will definitely just rank very well on the list. This is by design, right? Um, so what we end up with is kind of like an implicit UCP algorithm. It's just the, the fact that we're ordering stuff uh, implies that, the, that we will tend to, to pick the things with over predictions. And so what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, we have some type of a selection bias in our training data because suddenly it turns out that most of our training examples come from this right-hand side of the top. Uh, and then we're not really seeing the things on the left-hand side, left, left side of the plot because they just rank too low and users never really saw it. It doesn't become a training example for us the next day. Um, so at this point, it, it's kind of okay. It doesn't really matter because the true, true mean is still the same. I mean, these points are, are predicted uh, are still trying to predict the true mean. But the problem comes when the same model tries to train on this data the next day. So what happens is that it just only sees over predictions, right? The training, because the model is the same, so it will make exactly the same over prediction error while training, which means that the loss will be high. And so the only thing that the model can do is just shift the mean. I right? thought so maybe I can show this graphic again. So basically what happens is we selected our training data while serving to users. The next day the model trains on it, shifts its mean. Uh, so we now we have less training examples. Uh, and then something has changed. We didn't anticipate it, right? We ran a lot of A-B tests. It looked good. But something under the cover has shifted. And, and this is something that is not really easy to measure with A-B tests. 
Um, just to keep in mind that the choice of objective is really, really important. Because even if you're not looking at the system, the system is continuously optimizing for that objective. So some consequences of this. Make sure that you choose the objective that you believe in. Because if you're not believing your own objective, then probably you're not, your system will be doing something that you're not really wanting it to do. One thing that I really appreciate about YouTube is that we've been completely disjoint from the ads optimization, which is really nice because then we don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, we don't have to worry about this, these things changing under the cover, how the monetization in, impacts users. So basically the discovery system is purely based on the user satisfaction and, and we optimize only for that. Um, another consequence is that the higher the variance, the bigger the penalty that this model will, will, will see in, the, in practice. So reducing the variance is really important. That's maybe coming back to that scale. Why did we see these outliers in the beginning, right? Because the variance was high and I wasn't able to fit the data correctly. If we have bigger models, variance shrinks, and it's, it's good because then this effect is also smaller. We have less of these shifts that are happening under the cover. Um, other thing is that spontaneous exploration is not sufficient. Basically, this implicit UCB that I have shown to you, it still causes this problem that most of the training examples are gonna be over predictions. So the, the model will play a whack-a-mole game, trying to just penalize all these over predictions at training time. And then we shift the mean, causing the, you know, like some unintended consequences. So we just we decided to invest in intentful data acquisition, which is this slot, tick slot exploration uh, idea. Essentially, we would show, we would sample data differently. We're using a completely different system from this ML estimator and put it on a specific position to gather information and maybe create training data out of that. So that allows us to sample both from the right-hand side of the plot, but also from the left-hand side of the plot. So under predictions are equally important for the, for the ranking system. Um, there's actually a paper that is, that is published uh, uh, this year on Rexis, uh, online matching. I encourage you to, to attend the, the session. Uh, uh, some of our colleagues will talk more about this system. Okay, so the, the, another topic I wanted to talk about is modeling product behavior. Essentially, we like to simplify the way we think about recommendations and, and the prediction tasks. We always kind of think about, oh, there's a, you know, a single item and we're trying to predict the CTR or maybe some other objectives out of that single item. But the product can be much more complex and, and that complexity is important actually. So just to give you an example, this is the YouTube watch page. Well, first of all, there's a lot of going on here. Um, but to point out a few things, there's a pre-roll ad. How is that affecting the watching behavior? Maybe, you know, if there's a pre-roll ad, the user is more likely to abandon the video, or maybe less likely to abandon the video. It's, it's hard to say, right? But there's something happening. So we, we can't just ignore the fact that the ad was, was running. Uh, on the feed, we see some feed ads, also they push down the racks. Maybe this, is, this has some effect. So um, maybe the fact that the recommendation didn't get a click was not really because it was bad, but it was just pushed down by another element in the UI. Uh, another interesting thing that we've noticed is that if we show recommendations which are too appealing, then they will actually lead to, to user abandoning the watch page itself. Because if they, they look at this very interesting thumbnail, oh, why don't I click on that one instead of you know, spending time watching this video? Which is a kind of an interesting problem because we do affect how users enjoy their videos and, and we have to take this into account. Uh, and also there's just many competing racks which can steal clicks from each other, which also cannot be really ignored. So a, a very simple way of addressing this problem is, is called positional bias. So we could just say, let's look at the position that the item was displayed on, and then we would create a kind of like a UI logic that is added to the logic of the 
it's a PR prediction, and that offsets our expectations about the, the, click, the clicks that we should get from that item. So the lower the item, and, and maybe we could also contextualize it based on the UI and the device type, like whether it's mobile, desktop, um, we would have different expectations on the click. And that is actually, that, that was a pretty big win for us when we did that, because the model was able to fit the true intention of the user better. So it wasn't about the placement of the item, but rather the connection between the user and the item that was, that was more important. So then we can precisely model the loss that should go into the parameters of the model with this offsetting of the, of the UI. Um, but the interesting thing is that this can be done even more precisely if you think about it a little bit more. It turns out that you can model this user behavior in a more precise way, assuming that there is some user browsing model that is happening under the cover. So let's say that, the, that we assume the user always starts at the top of the feed, and then they, they just continue scrolling their eyes down, down the feed. And every time they have these three options, they can either abandon the feed altogether, they can click an item, or they can scroll down, which means that they just their eyes go, go down. <coughs> and in this sense, it is still a positional bias, but it's much more precise because the, the chances of us getting a click on position three, you know, you can clearly see that they're, they're diminishing because the user could click on all these items above, they could actually abandon as well. Um, so it's implicitly capturing this positional bias, but in a much more precise way. There's a difference between seeing a recommendation above that has a very high chance of clicking and difference when the recommendation above is, has low chance of clicking. Uh, and that should be reflected in the loss of the model. So this is a kind of a more precise way of, of capturing the user behavior. And, and these models can be more complex. This is just an example. You could imagine maybe an interaction between these items in a more, more um, advanced way that maybe the two views are very similar. And that also changes our, our expectation on the click uh, versus these items are not, not similar. Um, just a food for thought. Um, okay, so the last slide I wanted to talk about is, is a little bit about the future of our recommendation systems. Um, I think we have all seen the, the surge in LLMs and how, how popular they've become. Uh, I think this is, this is amazing. I'm, I'm a huge fan of LLMs. Uh, I think there is a big opportunity for us as a recommendation community to leverage LLMs. Uh, of course, we have to figure out how to do this and, and how to harvest the power of these big models in a way that is, that is suitable for the recommendation tasks. Um, there is one interesting thought that I had when I was thinking about the, uh, these big models, is that coming back to this timeline, we started with 2015 model, it was just embedded, right? I was talking about, it was like a super simple hash map. We, at, at serving time, we just retrieve uh, some weights and then sum them up, that was the, that was the prediction. Uh, and nowadays, the 2023 model, still a lot of parameters in embeddings. Right, embeddings are, are fantastic, they're very efficient. We just do a lookup in some hash table, it costs us nothing. Uh, we can train implicit representations of our videos and, and uh, or, or channels, it's, it's really great. Of course, there's some component of the dense compute. So this is the, the deep neural layers that are on top of the embeddings and, and, and potentially some other input features. They make feature process, they, they make the system magical. But then I contrasted with these LLMs. They are just completely different scale. It's just the dense part is humongous and then the embeddings are tiny. Uh, what does it mean for us? It, it means that there's some gap in between and it's not clear how to fill that gap. Should we have a, a more balanced approach where some of the compute is offloaded into embeddings where maybe the compute is not necessary? Just as, a, as an example, um, Let's say a creator, my favorite creator uploads a video two, hour, two hours ago. Do we need you know, like 
hundred billions of parameter model to figure out that I'm going to like that video? Probably not, right? Like it, it sounds like a pretty simple thing to, to, to figure out. Um, but if we would take the approach of LLMs, then we would basically just run this entire huge compute to, to figure out something that is pretty obvious. Uh, and I think more research is necessary in this space. How do we make these models efficient in cases where the compute is not really necessary versus use the compute when the uh, when we believe that we can do better. Um, all right. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I encourage you to apply for some hiring positions. Obviously, this is a, <laughs> some self-serving uh, ad, but uh, yeah, I'll take questions. Like user browsing model that you showed uh, for position based uh, position based models. Do you just do that on positives or you do that on items that you don't really get to that often? Can you please speak on the mic? Oh, can you please use the mic? Just large enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so my question is that when you in this user browsing model, do you get when you get feedback on some positive items? Do you do something similar for the non-clicked items as well? Well, it, it models both clicked and non-clicked items because the outcome can be no-click, as you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, so, it, it yeah, it trains on all possible um, scenarios. Oh, cool. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. I had a question also about the position bias estimation. So you showed that you are learning the position bias model together with the recommendation model. Is that right? So you're not doing any sort of intervention where you're like randomly shuffling the recommendations in order to better estimate the position bias. Is it just using production data as is? We do. We do absolute really exploration as well. So we have some some small percentage of our impressions are randomized. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. And uh, a follow-up question about the user modeling, sequence modeling. It looks like the modeling needs the previous item CTR or other scoring found properly to be estimated. In that case, that's the it's different from traditional serving, which each item is uh, scored individually, and right now it needs a context. How does this affect the serving and complexity in the model stuff? So these, you can think of it as training side optimization or serving side optimization. The training time optimization is slightly easier because we, we know what happened and we can just model it directly as a loss. Uh, serving time optimization is a little bit more complicated. Uh, yeah, but it's still possible. I mean, it, it, it's just the, the order of elements will depend on the, on the future reward as well. So just to um, reiterate, there's a difference between fitting what happened versus trying to maximize what will happen in the future. And, and maybe this slide is only showing how to fit what happened in the past. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks again for, for the talk. So yeah, my question is actually, I'm interested in the journey from 2015 to 2023, how were the um, interpretability as well as explainability factors um, also evolve from this uh, in, within this journey yeah. I think so a simple answer is it hasn't changed I don't think we were able to fully understand what these machine learning models are doing and we're not able to fully understand them today either they're just too complex for us to put. we have some insights we can kind of get a general understanding but they're not, it's not like a fully explainable system, if, that, if that's your question. I don't think it has changed that much, to be honest. I think. And 
were there any trade off where explainability become important when you give the recommendations, but then you move towards like more complex models? Again, I don't think it has changed much, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, the linear model, as I said, it had, it had billions of, of dimensions, right? so it was also hard to understand. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I want a question about call star problem for the items. Um, how do you make it? <laughs> Is it uh, made by your big model or you starting to show some items for users to collect some statistics or something? It's a combination of all. So we would obviously, we would nominate new candidates to the big model to try to rank them together with all the rest of the items. But we'll also have a separate system that is a completely separate stack to do explicit item exploration. Um, so that's something that we, we like, you know, is in a published paper. Um, so that more explicit system overcomes all the biases of the big system or the big ranker because we can collect unbiased data in that way. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. I'm, uh, uh, I'm very interested in the, about an uh, LLM topic. So people all over the world are talking about ChatGPT and LLM. And uh, in a recommender system community, uh, do you think it is a promising research direction to develop LLM enhanced recommender system? But in my opinion, uh, um, uh, at the least stage, I think it's quite, you know, uh, at a uh, the cost of a uh, high uh, inference cost and high training latency and uh, some disadvantages. But uh, at YouTube, the uh, very popular video recommender system, I, you, any, have you any plan or uh, uh, could you share any experience about this topic uh, for the uh, IS uh, community? Should we invest? To this topic and uh, how much uh, can we gain if we uh, spend more time to develop our own uh, as a topic? Yes, thank you. I would say that it's a big problem that we can't understand our systems. And it's, it's a problem from both explainability to the user, but also explainability to the engineer. If we don't know why a certain recommendation was made, it's very hard to debug it as well. So I think being able to have a system that can actually tell us why the recommendation was made can give us a lot of insights on how to improve it in the future. So I would say that, yes, this is a very interesting research. And I think it would be helpful. In terms of usage of LLMs for recommendation systems in general, yeah, there's quite a lot of research going on right now. And, and you know, I suspect there's probably half of people in this audience is interested in in these topics and you know thinking about how to use LLMs and either the LLMs themselves or or just the the method, the transformer method to improve recommendation systems. Yeah, the other half are thinking yeah, so, so, uh, two, we'll do those two questions and there's one from Oswald. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about the models that you're using. The main driver in there, is it fit probability? Um, and then also a follow-up question. Um, the, how do you handle negative sampling? Is it mostly by those uh, randomized impressions? Or do you have other mechanisms? Well, we have a multi-objective system. So it's, it's click is one of the things that we're interested in, but there's, there's far more. Uh, there's several different um, predictions of user satisfaction, and then we blend these together to do the final ranking. In terms of negatives, both positives and negatives come from the uh, from the product itself. So we, whatever we show to the user, we're gonna train on that. Unless it's a, a like a cross-entropy system where the negatives are implicit, but if you're talking about uh, explicit negatives, that usually is from the product directly.
Uh, yeah, so thanks from the top. And I'm kind of interested about the number two, the higher variance list, the higher penalty. So you said you use UCB for ranking the problem. And then in the UCB equation, so we have some hyperparameter that trade off between the mean and the variance. So why don't you tune them just for reduce the variance? I would say it's an implicit UCB. We're not controlling it because it just happens from the, est the estimation error. We don't know what the estimation error is exactly. We can kind of, we can maybe try to estimate it, but we would still not know if it's over or under estimation, even if we knew what the estimation error could be. I think it's just the consequence of the ranking by the score itself that causes this. So even if you're not thinking about UCB, your system will do UCB just because you're, the, the ordering causes that. Oh, yeah, I see. So, so two questions from offline. One is, um, why do offline evaluation results become more reliable if the model gets larger? It's a great question. I don't know if I know the exact answer to it. That's something that we've observed. Uh, I can speculate. I don't know if it's useful if I speculate or not. Um, it's very useful. Very useful. <laughs> <laughs> I love speculating, so we can spend another hour. I think uh, sometimes it, the system can show gains, not because it's more precise, but just because maybe it introduces more diversity, for example. And then you can look at A-B tests and yeah, this looks better, even though the system was actually worse in, in its ML loss. But I think at some point, if the system gets precise enough, we would no longer see these types of uh, wins. That's my hypothesis. Thank you. And the second question was, does scale here refer to the size of the model? Or do you mean the size of the data? Size of the model. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was curious in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, you, like the fast moving catalog of YouTube results in kind of the model being unreliable. What do you think are the unique challenges of having a catalog that's uh, that's fast moving and uh, what do you think are the important things to keep in mind when building a model specifically for uh, fast moving catalogs? So I think what happens is that the bigger the model, the more precisely it models the distribution. And if the distribution that it models is from today, they might not necessarily be applicable to tomorrow's distribution. So when the training data comes, it, it kind of get, can get easily confused. So that's why it, it it can, it can lead to some instability of the training itself. Um, well, one thing that we've noticed is that we can improve the optimizer itself so it doesn't really get uh, into these divergence issues. So I, I recommend reading the paper. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.